use the uh, the share that's uh, allocated to the residential class has gone up from around 46.7 percent to 49 percent, and the share allocated to the uh, the business class has come down from 51.8 to 49.4. So clearly you've had some success with implementing that policy. And all the discussion that I'll have today really focuses on those two classes, the business class and the, uh, the residential class. There is a, there are other, a small number of other classes, but we're not gonna focus on those uh, in this presentation. So the terms of reference that I was given was to essentially ask three, answer three questions. Uh, should council continue this shift away from the business class? Um, if yes, is the tax ratio the best indicator to, to use? And how far should that shift go? So they were the three questions I was given. And to, um, I'm gonna sort of give you my answers right now, not wait for the end. <laughs> uh, and and re 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 recognizing this is only a, a draft presentation, I'm sharing it with you and obviously seeking some feedback from yourselves. Uh, the answer to the first, I think, is yes. Um, the answer to the second, I think, is the, ta the tax ratio is not the best indicator and that there will be better indicators to use. Mm -hmm. And how far should that shift go? Probably not quite as far as what's uh, considered by a 3.0 goal in the uh, current policy. So I'll, also, I'll explain that, the rationale behind those things uh, as we go through. Uh, the question is, why, why did you select the tax ratio? I, I think, for, first of all, it's obviously a fairly intuitive indicator of equity. If you think about, um, uh, even within the residential class, for example, what's fair, you think, well, I pay the same tax rate as my, uh, the person who lives next door to me. So having the same tax rate is thought of as a sense of equity. So if you, when you think about the tax rate levied between a business and between residential, you might also think that having the same tax rate might be a sense of equity, or even if the tax rates are not the same, having some consistency in those tax rates. But there's been a marked increase in that tax ratio over time, and certainly the business community have uh, pointed to that increase and said this surely indicates a change in the burden of taxation on the business sector to the residential sector compared to the residential sector. And so these are the reasons why I think you probably looked at that and said, yeah, that's a good indicator to use. But it has its problems, and I'm going to try to illustrate it with a couple of simple examples. Let's first of all look at year one where you have a, a residential property around valued around a half a million dollars and a city tax rate and paying $1,900 in gross taxes. These are only city taxes, I'm not talking about the total tax bill at the moment. And a business community uh, property valued about $4 million and, and that by the way is about what a, a store on Government Street might be valued at from the point of view of an assessment. And paying the higher tax rate and obviously substantially higher taxes. Uh, interestingly enough, about $1,000 a week in property taxes is kind of interesting as a, as a number. With a business tax ratio of 3.6, that's, that's essentially where you are in 2011. Now let's just sort of do a hypothetical example that said, what happened now if the residential uh, values went up, but everything else, all the, the business values stayed the same, and you didn't change the tax ratio? Well, the, the obvious result is that there would be an increase in the um, amount of taxes payable by the residential sector. Fair enough, that's what you'd expect, perhaps if the uh, residential taxes go up. And so you get a 10% shift in the residential taxes simply because of the market shift in the assessed value of the property relative to the, the no change in the business value. What, however, you've taken a different policy and said, well, we wanted to counteract the effect of that increase in the assessed value by a change in the city tax rate and so that we keep the taxes payable the same as it was in year one. So this represents no change in overall taxes for either the business community or the residential community, but the tax ratio has gone up. So the tax ratio really, uh, a change in time in the tax ratio really reflects movements, the relative movements of assessment on the business properties versus the residential properties. If residential properties go up faster in value than business properties <coughs> and council makes a decision to hold the relative burden of taxes the same, it's inevitable that the business tax ratio will go up. It's just mathematics. That's just the way it works out. But it's not just a question of, of looking, comparing these mathematics. It's really a question of what is council trying to achieve here and what's the policy objective? If the policy objective here is to focus on taxes payable as the index of equity, as opposed to the rate or the ratio, then year one here is identical, uh, year two, pardon me, is identical to year one. 
what, you, what we've done is we've compensated for the assessment changes by changing the tax rate and the tax ratio to keep the actual taxes the same as it was in year one. So if you try to focus on taxes payable, you're going to get a different result than if you focus on the business tax ratio. If you focus or go back one and you focus on keeping the ratio the same, it's inevitable that the residential taxes will go up over time. So that's really what you have here is some interest in mathematics, but also the consequences of that about the implications for residential and business taxes. And the question mark about what's the most telling indicator? Is it the tax ratio or is it the taxes paid? And I want to come back to that later on. Here's another comparison I make for you, which is look at the, the, the compare Victorian Saanich. If you look at Saanich, they have a lower tax rate for the business sector. They have a lower uh, proportion of their taxes from the business sector. And a lower taxes per square foot, this is a, an example taken from a, uh, from a retail operation. And yet, their tax ratio is higher than in Victoria. So you've got a bunch of indicators that say taxes are somewhat lower for the business sector, but the tax ratio, they're saying it's higher. So the question is, what's the right indicator here? And is really the tax ratio a useful and compelling indicator uh, when you compare jurisdictions or compare within a jurisdiction? And I will be arguing that I don't think it's, a, it's the most useful of the indicators. So my conclusions are that the tax ratio alone is not, a indicated, is not a good indicator because you can have an increase in the tax ratio, but that's not always a sign of a problem. As I showed you before, you can have no change in taxes paid, but the tax ratio went up. It's an unreliable indicator when you compare jurisdictions, and it's really hard to decide what the right ratio should be because there's, there's a trend, upward trend in this tax ratio over time. The assessment trends will have a very big impact on the pace of change of this policy. Uneven shifts can be expected. Unlikely that shifts will ever end. Like it might, when, it, when you look at uh, your policy, where you have a policy of gradually reducing the, uh, the tax ratio, well, if, a set, if we follow the historical trend, which is assessments for the residential sector grow faster than the commercial sector, your shifts will never end, and you'll never reach that 3.0 objective. So uh, the question is, is there a better approach? And I hope to suggest one as we go through. I want to, however, before we do that, put the tax ratio issue in the context of property taxes overall. Because in my view, this is not really so much an issue about share. Is there a uh, copy of the slide deck? Oh, pardon me. Is there a copy of the slide deck? We do have one here. We, we can make some copies for you as yeah. yes, we go through. Uh, I appreciate it. In the future, any time that they're doing a PowerPoint, I'd appreciate to have a deck in front of me. Fair Thanks. Well. Then we can make notes as we go along. One, it gives me an indication of when to jump in and ask questions. Like, if you got an hour, hour and a half of presentation, I would do that. Yeah. If you got two more minutes, then I yeah. wouldn't. Fair so. enough. Fair and secondly, I don't have to take notes. So just a general standing. It's easier for council members to have that information in front of us. Thank you. So How long have you got? Two minutes? Ten no, minutes? No, not quite. But okay, no, I'm just jump in now. Okay. No, I'll, I'll, we'll go back. OK. Have, no, I'm happy to pause at this point and, and just talk about the observations so far, if that's helpful. Any comments? And I don't know where it is, anything that's in in here or, or part of the context, but fundamentally it comes down to the issue of equity. Yes. And the question that we always ask ourselves is, so far we've only been doing it intuitively, and I, and I appreciate that. Because inequity is on a different level. So if the question is, well, businesses pay 3 to 1, 3.6 to 1. Um, but they get to write it off on their property taxes or on their on their income tax, yeah, tax and them. residents don't. Yes. Right. The assessed value, although on the for a residential, is reflect reflection of market of what people are willing to pay, but the assessed value on commercial is probably more uh, reflective of what the property is worth in a commercial capacity. Do you know what I mean? Like as you say, that's the government street. Uh, person uh, versus um, uh, you know what somebody else elsewhere would pay and, and you get a higher assessment because you can make more money down there mm -hmm. theoretically mm -hmm. um, and so how do you assess the value of the services that each class consumes so would you you know would you be spending 40 million dollars on policing and that's your downtown core, which 
you would argue is in the first instance of the greatest benefit to the business, right? Uh, you'd almost argue if you didn't have all the businesses downtown, you wouldn't need to have that many policing in the car, especially when you look at it. But of course, then there's the larger issue of everybody living in the residences actually get to work downtown, and that's where they were, earn their income to pay for the housing. Um, so policing, fire. Um, you know, we always hear from businesses that, oh, wait a minute, I don't even get garbage collection. I got to pay that myself. Right. Versus, uh, so it's about trying to say, has anybody actually ever, in a Canadian context, which is way different than I would say in American context, sat down and said, like, wh where is the general use of city resources? Yeah, they Because as you start to get intuitive yeah. about e equity, it's having that understanding. They have, and, and I'm going to be covering that as we go through. Yeah, excellent. I had the okay. deck. I'd know that. And, and yeah. So, to me, you, you raised well, three issues there. One is obviously the is difference in valuation of the property between residential <coughs> and commercial. And if you're thinking about, is there is there kind of a can you put them essentially on the same index because they they kind of measure different things. So that's that's an issue. And so I, I think that's a, one of the reasons why. Um, you might be, you might think you might want to not use the ratio because they're essentially measuring different things, and that and that measurement changes differently over time. There's not, and I'll show you in a second. There's been a secular trend of housing prices going up much faster than uh, commercial property prices. So that in itself is going to say the ratio would change. But when you look at the under, the, is it really the the ratio you're most interested in, or is it the changes in the taxes paid? By the like that average store on Government Street versus an average and I see that. So I mean, here's the extra. Now here comes the extra implication. If you also want things as, as that's great, but taxes didn't increase. Now introduce a tax increase. You know, so we're going to increase taxes 3.5 percent yep. this year. Yep. What's driving that increase? Well, then you go back to that original question of, well, are we increasing it in areas who benefit from it? Should they pay more for okay. that? So, we'll so for back. example, we'll are we doing more downtown share. street cleaning? Well, that's yes. for the, anyways, those are the exactly. ones. Interesting, so interesting discussion. I, I think to the point of what you're probably going to lead into, if we look at the tax ratio <clears throat> 12 years ago, it was about two and a half to one. And, My next slide. <laughs> and, and what we've seen is, of course, exactly as you yes. articulated in the first example, we saw a rampant increase in, in, in residential taxes or assessments. assessments. And we tried to bring down the impact on the residential component by changing the ratio. Exactly right. Exactly yeah. right. And so this, this is this is do those. But you features. also have to recognize and throw in context, though, oh, is that over the past 10 years, the business tax provincially has dropped significantly. Yes. So, anyways, exactly. keep going. Exactly. Now, by the way, I, I, sorry, I, I, that wasn't my next slide because I, I got myself confused there. What I was going to do first was put the context of what property taxes as a whole have been doing. And this is the annual average increase in property taxes. Total, total revenue received through property taxes for the city of Victoria for the last 10 years. And it's been averaged just over about 6% with a slight sort of downward trend in the pattern. This might not be a number that resonates with you for the reason that when you focus on your annual tax adjustment, you focus on the impact on the average taxpayer. But this is the total tax revenue. And when you can now compare this to what's been happening to the rate of growth, annual rate of growth of the provincial economy, you can see in most years it's been somewhat faster and obviously in the recession years significantly faster. And when you compare it to the average growth in this consumer price index inflation and population, then that's the next that, that green green dotted line. You can see it's generally been higher than it, than uh, inflation and population. The components of the increase have been the blue one, which is essentially the increases in the dollars uh, paid by, as we say, existing residents or as existing taxpayers, and the, the the red part, which is the new construction, the extra revenue you generate through new construction every year. So when you produce your budget every year, you actually tend to focus on the rate of increase on the average taxpayer, which is what this blue line says. And that average has been between 4 and 5%, with it coming down over time. And, and, and your goal for this year is 3.5% compared to that uh, average. OK, I'm confused. Uh, I'm sorry, pardon me. That one says our average increase is around Four and a half. Four and a half coming down over time. That's but like four slides earlier, it says it's six. Yeah. 
I don't understand the difference between the two slides. So this this is the this is the increase that you would display as the average increase on the uh, on your existing taxpayers. And when you work out that work that out every year, you don't take into account new construction. That new construction isn't added into that calculation. So you're getting tax revenue from two sources. Increased taxes paid by your existing residents, if you like, and the increase that comes from the new construction. So when you look at the overall tax bill, it's different when you look at the impact on the average uh, average, fam average resident. So this could be the average business too, if you had equal impacts. And this, of course, has been faster than uh, the rate of inflation over this period. So the rate of inflation has been coming down, the rate of growth of taxes has been coming down, but the rate of growth of taxes is still faster than the rate of growth of inflation. So now, why do I emphasize this, pardon me? So it, it might be useful to have <coughs> The 3.5 percent, which is here, plus new construction. Did that be, does that help? So it's the average percentage of absolute taxes we receive, as opposed to the tax lift. I think is that correct? So yeah, yeah. So I go back to anyway. So you go back to the, the dollar values, the, the blue and the red one here. You have a, a difference in every year where you say, well, we've got a, an amount of extra revenue that's associated with new development. And then there's an extra amount of money that we receive by taxing, should we say, all those who are uh, existing taxpayers. Thank you. Got it. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Now, why do I emphasize this? I emphasize this because I think that when you talk to the business community, yes, they express a lot of their concern in the context of share, but actually I think their real concern is in taxes paid and the rate of increase of taxes paid. And so addressing the rate of growth of, it, of taxes overall is as important as it addressing the share issue. And I know that that's something on your agenda. So let's just look at what's been happening to the average increase in city property taxes for residential and business. You see in, in 2007, they started to diverge with the business growth rate being lower than the residential sector. Then they, they both went up, but still the business was lower than the residential sector. Then they moderated a bit, but more moderation for the business sector. Then they came together again. Then they deviated dramatically. This, one of the reasons, you've got a sort of an uneven pattern from year to year about the difference in these two lines. And that's one of the, the points I want to try to make to you about the difficulties about using the ratio. You're very much driven in your policy about what the market assessment is doing and the differences in those market assessments. So you don't get a nice difference. So even if you said in 2006, I want to see like the percentage difference between residential and non-residential grow at a different rate, it isn't a nice even picture. It isn't a nice steady picture. It's a picture that's driven very much by market trends. And I think in 2012, you'll see those sharp, that sharp divergence come back together again pretty much like it did in 2010. So again, that's a reason for me why you have, um, that isn't necessarily the best way to kind of execute the policy that you have in mind. The last thing I wanted to show you is something, Mr. Mayor, that you focus on perhaps. This is the rate of growth of residential taxes for the, to the city. Uh, this is the, shown a different way, shown in 2001 as 100 and then the overall growth. So 60% increase over that period. Business taxes over the whole period, obviously lower because of the policies you introduced. Now if we look at total residential taxes, the city taxes plus the school taxes plus other taxes, you can see that the growth rate has actually been lower. So city taxes have grown faster than other taxes. And for the business community, they've been substantially lower. That's the point, Mr. Mayor, that you made about the province uh, showing tax relief for the um, non-residential non sector. And you compare that to the CPI, and you can see that, in fact, the rate of growth of taxes, total taxes, and when uh, you talk to a business owner, it's the total taxes that they focus on. They have, that has not been quite so dramatically different from CPI over this period, but it certainly has for residential taxes over that period. Um, the last thing I want to show you is that the picture doesn't look the same for everybody. That, that you have the average property, and then you have above it what that what's been happening for this, I, this? I'm showing you assessment here, but assessment drives everything. So you've got a retail store, you've got a shopping mall, you've got an office tower. They've all been increasing actually somewhat faster than the, the notional average. Well, if they've increased faster, something's got to go slower, and it's the hotel sector. 
So, and then, now this is not everybody, but these are some of the bigger uh, uh, sectors, subsectors that you have in the commercial property. So, for example, when we went out and chatted to the business community and they talked about the rates of increase in taxes that they've observed, they were much higher than the average that we would have been talking about so far in this presentation. And it makes sense because some properties and some subsectors have grown faster than others. So it's important to recognize that there are this, there's this movement within subsectors, within, within the business sector as, as well as between the business sector and the residential sector. So what are the conclusions? Um, but my big one is that don't just focus on tax share, think about overall growth of property taxes. The total taxes have grown slower than city taxes for the business community, but still faster than the CPI. And the average for the class disguises the trends within the class. So all these things you have to bear in mind as we think about when, when, when business community come to you and say, I've got a problem, there are all those things that one could consider. So this is what's been happening with the city of Victoria. And uh, Councillor Coleman, this is what you, you said. There's, there's been this change in the business class ratio over, since 1985, that's when essentially municipalities were given the authority to set differential tax rates. There's been this kind of uh, upward trend in the ratio, not, not consistently upward, as you can see, periods of up and down, uh, but that consistent trend, and that comes from this. The fact that assessments have grown much more rapidly for the residential sector than they have for the business community, exactly what, as you had said. The annual increases are all over the place. You get some years in which the increases are faster for residential and, and other years in which they're faster for commercial. It's not a nice steady picture. But when the years when it is faster for residential, it's substantially faster. And so that's why you've had um, this secular trend towards uh, higher prices. But when you look at the share of taxes paid, you can see that the share of taxes paid by the business community went up, certainly, over in the 90s and, and early part of this decade. And you brought them down with your policy. But the share has never been less than around 48%. So it's you, the share you're at today is very close to kind of it's, it's the lowest it's ever been in the share of taxes paid by the business community. So let me just summarize what's been happening this decade. The business ratio has gone up dramatically, but the business tax rate hasn't changed, and the business share has gone down. So again, you've got kind of like three different indexes of what's been going on. And your policy focuses on the tax ratio issue, but to me, it doesn't tell the whole story. And that's why I'm concerned that focusing on that may not be the right thing to do. So further evidence that there are conflicting indicators, assessment trends explain the rise in the tax ratio. And you can only really support the tax ratio if you think it does one of two things, that it accurately reflects the difference in ability to pay or the benefits received. Is that, Mr. Mayor, exactly the two things that you, you focus on? And it's got to do it for both the business and the residential properties. Oops, sorry, that's the wrong button. Quickly, uh, I'll compare to some other jurisdictions. I chose these benchmark jurisdictions, uh, only BC within the CRD, similar population, and other core cities. And you can see, let me look at the tax ratio. You can see, Victoria is always going to be at the top on these, and at the top is the CRD, then you've got the Metro Vancouver, and then some other municipalities. And you can see a uh, relatively high tax ratio. But I already mentioned to you that Saanich has got an even higher tax ratio, which indicates that it's not a perfect comparison. However, it is still, it's still uh, something that needs to be looked at. The tax rate, uh, the admissible tax rate, again, Victoria is relatively high. Interestingly enough, you look at down at Prince George, that's a very, very high tax rate uh, compared to everybody else. Well, that just simply reflects they have low property values <laughs> relative to Victoria. And so, again... We so never talk about tax rate here. No, uh, but others do. Uh, other municipalities, when they yeah. think about that competitiveness issue, they often think about tax rate as the, the guide to that. Um, again, it's... it's we'll come no, back later, but why? But why? <laughs> what? I didn't know we could set the tax rate. We do set the tax rate. That's what we do, is we yeah. set tax rate. You, take, you set the rate, the ratio falls out from the rate. But we look at what we've traditionally done in Victoria is we look at the, um, we just look at the total revenue that we require through our budget. And then it's the, unless we're going to, um, then we look at uh, our tax policy in terms of, and in, in, uh, historically we often, um, the city uh, looked and they wanted an even increase. 
uh, by class. That's what we yeah. used to do. We'd say if there was a 3% tax increase, we would determine, calculate what the tax rate should be so each uh, class of property got a 3% tax increase. In the last few years... But I thought that was ratio. No, the, the, the tax ratio is what it, whatever it works out to in that case. It's the indicator it's of what you said your rates at. And so, and then in the last uh, couple of years, we focused on the tax ratio more uh, with the view of reducing um, the business class ratio. Okay. And again, it's just then it's the math that one of turns out the tax rate needs to be. By the way, I would say that uh, until about five years ago, almost every municipality uh, did what Brenda just described, which is to focus on keeping the average lift in taxes the average residential property the same as for the average business property and then, and then did all the math to kind of work out the tax ratio and the tax uh, the tax rates and tax ratios have fallen out of it but the policy objective would to say if we've got a four percent increase overall let's make it four percent for the average homeowner and four percent for the average commercial property okay so the tax rates however are relatively high uh, much higher than Vancouver for example but again Vancouver property values are higher than they are in Victoria, so not a perfect comparison. Um, this is a class six taxes, and here Victoria stands out. You can see we have in Victoria the highest proportion of taxes raised from the business community compared to anybody else. And so on the surface you might think, aha, that's, that's where we're going wrong. <laughs> that's a telling indicator that the, that the policy is, is not very good. But in fact it's not that telling, because if you look at the business assessed value per person, you can see that Victoria is one of the highest. Uh, it, it's, it's as high as Vancouver. And if you do another comparison, which is look at the value of the improvements, business improvements to residential improvements, <coughs> Victoria stands out quite clearly as being very high. Um, you're a unique city, which you know, because you are truly the most core of the core cities that there are in BC. It, because you have the relatively small boundaries and not that much residential. So therefore, it's not surprising, therefore, to find that you collect a lot of money from the business community, and that by itself is no indicator of having done anything inappropriate. So that's important to know. So if, you, if people argue that you have um, high business taxes in Victoria and they should be lowered, are we going to see, therefore, that you have low residential taxes in Victoria? Well, no, we don't that your residential taxes per capita are relatively high in Victoria compared to other jurisdictions. So it, that, that looking at this alone wouldn't suggest that you've undertaxed the residential sector and overtaxed the uh, business community. Unless, of course, it, your taxes overall are higher than anywhere else, which is a possibility. So on that one, though, I mean, you get to adjust this. For example, like I look at Langford, which is like 350. Yes. But one of the things that came self-evident well, became evident during our garbage debate is um, you don't have municipal garbage collection in Langford. Exactly. That you have to go and pay two hundred and fifty dollars exactly. a year more. Exactly. So their exactly. actual cost, if you factor yes. it in, that they're pretty much the same cost in Langford. Yeah. Uh, right. if, in so, fact, if I, uh, you know, we, I, I had another slide which I didn't put in because of amount of time, which tried to show the taxes and non-taxes, if you like, on the average home, and uh, the current still. Sorry, I'd mean, like to see that. Yeah. It, okay. Because well, everybody it, says I'm going to Langford because the taxes are cheaper exactly. there, but you go. And the same thing, thing and the other issue is that um, some services are provided by the regional district in some of these municipalities that are not provided by the municipality. So again, you have a, a, a difference in this okay. picture. Thank you. But once you, do, once you look at all these things, Victoria is still relatively on the high <laughs> side, though. Yeah. Sorry, Brent. Uh, garbage collection, though, is not included in here because we have it as a user fee. We don't. Uh, okay, so this doesn't reflect user fees. This figure. is just okay. Tax. So, so you'll be, we'll be adding on to both of those lines when we add on <coughs> everything. But gotcha, the, that other picture Damn. showed a second, the second story that <laughs> Victoria is on the right hand side. Sorry for bringing it up. <laughs> <laughs> the last thing I wanted to show you uh, was that the when you're thinking about the tax ratio, think about yours is not the only tax ratio out there in, in Victoria. Uh, school taxes, they don't set it this way, but it's an implied tax ratio. The province sets school taxes residential and business, and that tax ratio is higher. And you're, I'm sure you're probably aware that the tax ratio for transit is quite a bit higher for the business community than for the residential. A lot of the business community will focus on the 
hospital district tax rate, which is much lower, 2.4, has been essentially the same uh, since uh, the middle of the 1980s. But actually, that tends to be an anomaly today rather than uh, the norm. So it's important to recognize that, again, when you look at the city ratio compared to some of these other ratios, you're not necessarily in a bad place compared to them. I'm going to go past that. Then. Conclusions. So again, these comparative, you know, when you compare to other municipalities, you don't really get a simple message coming out of it. It's not that, um, you know, you can't just simply look at an average for other municipalities and choose that and adopt it. So I'm actually very, very cautious about using these intermunicipal comparisons. I tend to look more at what's going on inside the municipality, what's happened over time, and this economic indicators. And so this looks at what's been happening, for example, for building permits. This looks at commercial building permits in uh, Victoria uh, and the CRD over the last decade. And as you can see, there's a slight downward trend in the value of those commercial building permits in Victoria, an upward trend for the region as a whole. You, you, I mean, you're aware of this. Um, it, but it would be a concern since you are, I mean, obviously one of the characteristics of the core city is to be the commercial core. The relationship between commercial to residential investment in the core has been going sharply down. Obviously, this is, as some people say, this has been the decade of the condo and uh, in, the, uh, in the city. And so therefore, you would expect to see some uh, downward trend here. But obviously, when you, ex when you rely so heavily on this piece of your tax base, to see this rebalancing of, the, uh, of new construction would be a concern for, for you over time if it continued. Uh, vacancy rates, the vacancy rates for the downtown uh, area has gone up sharply in recent years, as you tell. Um, not so much for the shopping centers as they have for the places like the Government Street and that type of thing. And the vacancy rate for office buildings have also been going up uh, in recent years, uh, both in the, in the downtown area and to some extent in the suburban area. I'm always cautious about presenting vacancy rates uh, because Vacancy rates are affected by new construction. When you have to bring a whole new construction on, on stream, the vacancy rate goes up. So you've got to be real careful about just looking at the vacancy rates alone. However, and nevertheless, there's a bunch of economic indicators, including the concerns of the business community. And their concerns, I think, are that the property taxes over the last decade have been growing faster than the rents and faster than other occupancy costs. And uh, that there are higher taxes in the core compared to other areas, the CRD. So, and here, this focuses on taxes paid, total taxes paid. They don't talk so much in share when you talk to an individual property owner. They talk about their bottom line and how that's changed over the last decade. So the conclusion is that, to me, the, you've got a, ye a yellow flag with these trends in commercial investment and vacancy rates, and that there is increasing com commercial, commercial competition in other areas of the CRD, and the tax increases are a concern for business. So, in thinking again about the share issue, you've got to think about this broader issue as well. Now, what other considerations might there be in making a decision here? This is the point, Mr. Mayor, that you made. Have other people looked at the split of benefits? And the, the, there have been a couple of studies in BC. The one that I'm most familiar with is the one that is in Vancouver, which uh, suggested that the direct benefits to the business community was about 25% of the budget compared to 75%, pardon me, 25% of the, the, of the taxable budget compared to 75% residential, and that would compare to like a 50-50 split for the taxes. So the business community said, you know, we're paying 50%, but we're getting 25%. So that, if we look at it from that kind of direct benefits point of view, that piece of work suggested that, um, you know, that they, that they are significantly overtaxed. But you've got to be awfully careful, awfully careful about those studies, about the way that they've gone about measuring those relative benefits. And first of all, and, and they only measure what one would call the direct benefits. You know, those things that, that kind of directly service. How many times might a, a fire truck come to a business community uh, property as opposed to go to a residential property, for example? And fire trucks are a good example because most of the call outs are, are, for, uh, are for people problems. They're not for business problems. So uh, you, um, you have the situation then of being very careful about how the calculation is done. And secondly, there are indirect benefits to business of having a vibrant and, and healthy and, uh, and, and 
well-served residential community because it attracts people to, to the community and it allow, enables them to attract workers to their businesses. So, I mean, one of the reasons that, like, when we talk to people, and I did a piece of work in Vancouver when we looked at their tax issues. Um, when you talk to the business community, they don't necessarily want to give up their ex expenditure on recreation centers or parks or the arts or other things because they make a, a community where their employees want to, to live and also where their, their customers want to be. So you, if you just look at the direct impact, it doesn't pick up those indirect benefits. The other consideration, however, is that uh, only people vote, and uh, so that, that's you know there is a there is an issue that says well perhaps the people ought to pay more the share of the taxes if they are the ones who vote. Okay, so my conclusion is I do believe you should have further tax relief. It's warranted by higher taxes in the region. I again I focus on the region rather than those other municipalities. The need to sustain this vibrant commercial core that the benefits received are likely smaller than the taxes paid, and that the accountability is primarily to the residential taxpayer. But I think only a modest additional shift is required because the residential taxes are relative, already relatively high. And that really, I think this, that as well as focusing on this modest shift, there should also be the focus on the overall tax increases. Which indicators should we use? And I'm going to go. I, I'm not going to go through this in the interest of time. I think I've told you already. I don't like the business tax ratio, and the, this is summarizes why not. I like the business tax share, and, and I, I'm not going to waste your time with this. I'm just. I've got a couple of others which we can come back to if you're interested. My conclusion is, use the tax share rather than the tax ratio. In other words, go back to what Brenda said was the the way that you did it five years ago, uh, looking at the rate of increase, and ask yourself, okay. If we now want to think about changing the share of business, think about your average increase, say it's going to be, say you're aiming for 3.5% this year. What would you want residential and, and commercial to be? So I, I'm going to give you an example, but in fact my recommendation is going to be, say, make it so that business grows by 3% and, and, and residential grows by 4 around that 3.5 average. What this does is, by moving to the tax share, it lets you decide the pace at which you implement that change. If you stay with the tax ratio, the market, the assessed value dictates that share, that, that pace of change. How big a shift? Well, I think this is the hardest question. I don't think there's abs any absolutely right answer. So my recommendation is you move cautiously in the right direction. And again, you keep monitoring those key indicators. My sub specific recommendation, again, this is a draft, is to continue to reduce the share from where you are now to about 48% over three years, excluding the effect of new development. And so, since you've never, the, the, the share has never been lower than 48.6 before, so you'd be in new territory, and it's consistent where Vancouver is right now. And that would, and, and the way you implement that is, as I just said, if you have an average of 3.5%, you'd have business taxes will grow up look, half a percent less, Residential taxes half a percent more, and you're able to kind of keep that. That, or you, you personally could, as council, could decide how wide a gap you wish that to be. It would not be driven by the assessment shifts. Revisit the policy in four years and see how much those indicators are, are matching out at that time, and focus your efforts on, as I know you are going to, on the overall rate of increase of property taxes. That I think will give as much uh, relief to the business and, and attention to business as the is this shifting issue. Sorry to go on so long. That's that that's the summary of the of the, the thinking today on that. Don't be sorry at all. That's it's it's a difficult complex area and we've in many ways trivialized it by focusing on the ratio. Um, and it it is an imperfect tool but it does recognize trends. So we see a trend over the last ten or twelve years that has been seen as a disbenefit to business. I would argue any indicator isn't going to be terribly helpful when we compare it to other areas, particularly other jurisdictions, particularly not in this region. What we are trying to do is find a competitive uh, opportunity for our downtown to thrive and pay an appropriate level of taxes. And the, their taxes, in the absolute terms, have gone up. But so they have for residents as well. Exactly. Isn't it? exactly. Committee members, do you have? Comments, questions? Um, many. <laughs> and many of these, although to a certain extent, it's, it's uh, 
I know you were tasked to look at the, the ratio, but on many of these, you could put insert business, uh, sorry, residents as well. You know, in the sense that, in some of the conclusions is, uh, you know, um, um, oh, you can do have residential taxes are too high. Um, I hope so because that, that's certainly one of my my you know my thoughts here is that you need, you, it, it's a balancing act. You can't just look at the one side of the equation; you got to look at the other side too. That it's both. Um, and, and those indicators for the residential side, uh, you know, uh, say that the taxes have been going up quite significantly. So that's. And my instinct immediately is to say, how do we take this presentation to a joint meeting of the Chamber of Commerce and DVBA? Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a good presentation that allows for a more in-depth look. I mean, I wouldn't say that the ratio is trivial. I, I think there's just one way of looking at it, but fundamentally it captures that overall concern of both businesses and residents, which is, you know, um, are just generally how much we have to pay in taxes, and perhaps I mean more a relative way is how much we have to pay in tax increases. Uh, too too high, and what's too high, and those are hard to uh, impact. So there's sort of double questions there, which is sort of like we need to take this to have this discussion with those that have been driving the tax ratio discussion, which is the DVBA in the chamber. Yes, Brenda. Um, just so you know, uh, the committee knows we did meet with um, the DVBA. Um, and we met with the Chamber of Commerce uh, just at the start of the project to let them know because they knew um, that, that the city was, was doing that. So we did get some input from them. Um, and, um, and I'd like to say that uh, they've been extremely helpful and DVBA actually, uh, some of their members actually shared uh, data um, that Peter could use in terms of some of the properties. Um, so the next step, um, I would really suggest that Peter uh, meet with them again to give them a view of, of what um, uh, what some of his uh, draft findings are to again get input, but I would suggest that um, that would be they're very much aware of, of, uh, of the study and, and what Peter's doing. So I think it would be very important to share this uh, with them. Yeah, I think I'd like a, a bit more structured formal thing where we actually yeah. have Peter come and present. Mm -hmm. uh, we invite uh, the members of the chamber and, and, and DVA and council to come. Mm -hmm. It's a conversation that we need to, to have, and that would be of, of great use. Uh, more than just going back and going, you know, I mean, it, it's that, that uh, the level of understanding and, and uh, of all stakeholders. Uh, the second one is, and I guess I need to, uh, maybe for another date, but I want to understand, you know, uh, the the fundamental slide that props is the most important one. I don't have a now well, I do, but it's probably slide 13, I think. Slide 13. Let's go to slide 13. See if that's right. This one? Yeah. So <laughs> Listen, this might catch your attention. Is that the right? Uh, Pardon me, because I. Uh, yeah, this is uh, this one here. Oh, this one. Ah, okay. Not that one. Which one you meant? Yeah, and what's the? Green line for like CBI. The, the green line is the is the combination of population and inflation. Um, I, 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 the I know there's been a, by the way it's a little bit of an aside. There's been quite a debate provincially about the sort of excessive rate of growth of municipal spending and, and uh, what how one indicated for that. And, and I know some commentators focus on uh, population and inflation as the right index for that and and. Um, I, why I put on the GDP is because I personally don't think that I think the GDP is actually a better in, index over time, because you would expect that over time that it would be reasonable that the municipal share of the total economy would keep up with the rate of growth of the economy. Um, and now it will be uneven because there's there's booms and recessions in in the economy, um, and uh, so I I don't actually think that population inflation is necessarily the best index that one should use, but I put it on here because it's a very common index that people use uh, these days. Well, the question is, does GPD uh, reflect, or, or what's the, what's the uh, connection between you know, gross domestic product and property assessment? Well, it doesn't. See, and, 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 and so that's the difference. We've only got one blunt hammer called property taxes. 
really. Yeah, like, but in one in one sense, it's you know I, I like to sort of say, well, yeah, yeah, that's the sort of that's the instrument you have over here. But if you really try to think broadly speaking about the objective that you're trying to achieve here, then I, I can think it might be reasonable to say, forget about the the mechanics of how I get there, but I do want. Um, my prop, the property taxes on me as an average homeowner to grow by, you know, in line with inflation or something over time. That would be one, one kind of way. Of yeah. So I mean, all. ultimately, in line, I'm saying that that I mean, even if you take a 2011, um, it's an indication that the, the property, sorry, the the, the um, consumer price index and population growth is about, I'm going to guess, about three yeah. percent. About three percent, but my taxes uh, is about. Four and a half. Okay, but I, 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 well, and I know I've sort of confused you by putting these two slides on. It, it, they've always got to differentiate between the total taxes that you're raising, the combination of this tax on the average person and the new growth, versus simply looking at the taxes on the average person, uh, average household. And when you when you present, when but you the whole bit, I mean, people always say the reason why I want new growth is because it's I then I'll pay less. Yeah. So how come we keep getting new assessed revenue, uh, all this new growth, and we're still paying more? Right. Well, exactly. So you're, what's you're, your answer? This is the well, <laughs> you're spending more. <laughs> <laughs> so <I'm> spending. <laughs> there is, there is only one so we're spending more than our growth is, though. That's the question, right? you to if you look. If this is your what you you talk about on your if you when you send your your notice out every year, Mr. Mayor, saying your taxes are growing by whatever. This is the number that you focus on. You know, so that this is the the tax impact on the average taxpayer. But this is not all the money you have to work with. The money you have to work with also includes that new construction. So um, you, this is quite. This is a very reasonable way to look at it because it's the impact on me as on my property tax bill. Is my bill going up four percent? That's what I'm interested in knowing. So it's a very important thing to focus on in that respect. One way to try to think about this is it kind of like conceptualize it. Is that if you had no growth in the economy, this is probably where you'd want to be. You know that the average would grow, the, the average would be in line with inflation, and you kind of keep it. And, and you had no growth in population, and and all you had was inflation. You'd expect taxes to keep up with inflation. That's what you'd expect. But now, what do you, assume you have growth in the sense of the productivity of the economy and the number of people in the economy. Well, both those things are going to get reflected in new development. So you've got new, new both. New people coming in to live here. You got to you got to provide services for them. Yeah, new demand for services. And then you've got productivity of the economy, which is reasonable. You should share in the in, in said, where should that productivity go to? Should it all go to the federal government? Should it all go to the provincial government? Or should some of it be come to improving local services? Yes, to the third one. Yes. And so, <laughs> using some of that productivity to improve local services or sustain local services in in the face of difficulties of sustaining them, that's a strong argument. So you really got to differentiate between this impact on the individual versus the overall pot that you have to play with. And the overall pot comes from these two sources, existing taxpayers and new growth. I don't know if I'm confusing you more than helping you with this, but that's the... It, no, you just introduced a new element of tax shifting between levels of government. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it also highlights... Well, they, they remember they get their growth through the through any growth that comes through pro, uh, profits and spending, and you don't get any of that. The only growth you get is through that growth in the assessment base. That's your only opportunity to tap into the real growth in the economy. Yeah, no, exactly. It's like our, it's like but our also conference. Also highlights right? the conundrum for us in that these are absolute numbers, but if you run those numbers from over ten years, the cumulative compounded impact is not in the four to five percent range. Mm -hmm. It's more than fifty percent. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. In absolute right. values paid. Absolutely right. There is, and that's um, what addresses the mm -hmm. unaffordability issue, or the. the and and if, I, if the, I did these numbers on a per capita basis, it would probably be even stronger yeah. growth. Well, because you saw in one of your slides it was eighty percent on the business side over a decade. Yeah, yeah. that's so those are you, you, you know. It, you can you can show it different ways, but I, you know I, I don't think what the way you focus on this and your budget deliberations is I don't think anything wrong in that. I think that's a pretty fair way to, to do that from year to year. But then when you're looking when you're doing your sort of your fiscal planning issues for five years out, then I do think you have to look at those bigger pictures. So on your last slide, which is the way you approach the last bullet, very last that we continue to efforts to reduce the yes. overall rate of increase. Yes, because that has has to be ultimately where we go. Yes. Um, in terms of both equity for 
the different sectors of, of taxpayers. Not exactly. just business, that we have a 1.5%, which I assume is industrial. Uh, you've, got light in, you've, got light, you've got light industrial there, yeah. and you've got some small uh, utilities and some other small things. I mean, I think that the, probably the relief that we might feel is that we're not a one industry town, where the, where the like Catalyst, where the ratio on the industrial side was 61. And that is forcing some industries into bankruptcy protection, which has a profound impact on the municipality in the long run. So it's, we're not there, but it's it's a serious one that we have to address. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, I think the mayor's suggestion that we do take a look at a workshop with uh, the chamber and the BIA is useful um, because I, this has to come forward to council. I suspect the if it's coming April fifth, I suspect the discussion around our table will be um, intriguing <laughs> as we try and wrestle with something that we. I don't mean that the ratio is trivial, but I think we've tended to trivialize the relationships <clears throat> by reflecting it just through the, the ratio. So I, I think it is an important one, and I thank you for that. Okay, I'm, thank I'm, you. I'm cognizant of the fact that we've got more on the agenda. If there's uh, if Fair there's uh, questions, uh, or, uh, you could you could email me, and I can forward them to Peter if, if you think there's something that, that uh, you feel that uh, he should consider before he finalizes the report. That would be well, and I think the context for all of us is then it would be useful to take a look at the five-year cumulative tax impact and try and give some guidance to that as well. We haven't been very good on that in the past. We, we focus on the one year, and it's, it's useful to have a, a longer perspective and give some guidance to staff on that. Can I have a moment well, to receive the, your question? Sure, but uh, so one, it's nice to see in a certain extent that we worked hard to bring the tax increase down. It was nice seeing that downward t trend, but now it explains why, as you keep trying to get those taxes down, that there's still major concern and angst seems to be growing out there, and you understand that it's the relative versus the absolute. Mm -hmm. um, as a suggestion, and I don't know if it's the motion to receive is pro most properly in order, I think there would be, if, if this is coming to council when? April 5th. April 5th? Well, if we wanted to inform the tax rates. I would really like, and I know it'll be a bit of a difficulty, and we'll have to think about it as, as how we can pull it off, but I think it'd be of great value to have that meeting, and I, and, my, and I know that the council will be informed of it, have their own input, and would appreciate it, but actually have, why don't we just do it, call a meeting at 7 o'clock some night in the next two weeks before it gets there, invite the DBBA, invite the chamber, and invite the residential, uh, the, the resident uh, associations to come. So they can all see the presentation, we can all get the information, and then it gives them an opportunity to inform council moving forward as we start to have that discussion. Because just as, you know, to a certain extent, uh, I mean, part of the conversation is the business saying yes, um, shift it over to the residential. We need to hear from the residential about, you know, we need to balance the discussion. But all of that will help inform council. So if there's somehow we can pull that off in the next, you know, say 10 days, like <coughs> whatever, we figure it out. Uh, that's something that we can look at to, to send out the invitations to make that happen. It's just about making sure that you guys are available. But, but it allows us to make a decision, an informed decision, as opposed to one in the vacuum. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you do, we'll work on it. I'm sure I'll get behind by everybody. <laughs> sure. Well, <laughs> but you know, I'll, I'll be right back. Motion to receive? Sure. Yes, motion to receive. Yep. Thank you. All in favor? Thank you. Back to the Naming rights. Oh, all right. Council are all done. Move. You don't necessarily have to. I don't have to move. No. Oh, all right. I can rely upon our staff person. No, she's got a PowerPoint. Oh. Oh, yeah. oh, do you have a power? I, I do. do have a PowerPoint. Yes, yeah, that's right. Okay. It's not really as sophisticated as that. <laughs> but I thought it would be just easier for people to follow along. And I'm admonished by the mayor. I don't have copies for people. Terribly sorry, Brad. You do, though, have, and I just provided it with Councilor Mouth as well. Uh, you do have, though, the document that actually speaks to the detail. Aha! Okay. So there is a document attached to this uh, that speaks in much more detail than what you'll see on the slides. I uh, wanted to use some slides just to give you a sense of some of the higher points. It's not nearly as long as the previous one, so it won't take too long, but uh, just to do a bit of an introduction. Uh, 
Uh, no one will be surprised that this is coming up at this point. It's actually a, uh, an idea that's been percolating for some time around the city of Victoria. I understand it has been considered before in different contexts, uh, but given the uh, emerging concerns, I think that we all share around our ability to uh, not just uh, continue to pay for our existing services, but to consider the opportunity to enhance our services, and in particular to create new sources of funding for the potential to uh, actually work more quickly on our infrastructure demands. I think that it's uh, not inappropriate for us to have this conversation again. Uh, it is not an unusual concept for many cities to begin to consider what terms and regulations and principles and values they bring uh, to a discussion of the possibility of naming rights for civic properties. And a variety of different uh, Canadian cities, 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 the cities around the world have already uh, moved into this uh, particular realm with a variety of different uh, rules and regulations and products. And of course, uh, in the document, it talks more uh, speci precisely about which cities uh, are particularly notable in Canada. Uh, Quebec City, one of the most uh, recent, of course, going into new production of their arena, attaching to the actual construction a requirement for it to be named uh, by uh, a company that's predominant in Quebec for a significant amount of money. In British Columbia, of course, uh, the most common examples that are used, of course, are in Vancouver with uh, TELUS naming the uh, Science World and also the change from uh, the GM place off to uh, the, uh, uh, the new uh, Rogers Centre. And most interestingly, comparatively speaking, in Salmon Arm, just recently, uh, the uh, Salmon Arm community uh, just actually uh, leased the uh, naming rights for their own local community hockey uh, arena to Shaw. So it's certainly not an uncommon idea, but it's an idea that obviously we need to approach with some caution and to, of course, ensure that we uh, couch it in some very important rules and regulations and uh, ideas for making sure that it is appropriate for our city. The idea today is to just briefly go over this with you, and then uh, the recommendations at the end are simply to forward it on to the Governance and Priorities Committee for further uh, discussion. So first off the bat, let's talk about why we're going to do this. If we do, uh, it's obviously about uh, creating uh, some rules and regulations to provide some consistency uh, for how, whatever we do, if we do, uh, to provide some guidance for any applicants or uh, folks or corporations or individuals who may want to uh, proceed in this direction. Obviously, to make sure that we protect the reputation, integrity, and standards of the city, we do not in any way want to proceed down this road in a way which would compromise what we believe or to be what brings uh, people to Victoria. And that goes to obviously making sure that we align whatever we do, if anything, with our values, priorities, programs, and services. Fortunately, the city of Victoria lays out in some detail, and so it is not uh, uh, difficult for us to find the information to use as a guide to ensure that we don't diverge and put ourselves in a position where we're looking at uh, offers uh, for some kind of a naming right uh, with a corporation or an individual or an entity at all, uh, which flies in the face of what we believe is important to Victoria. And obviously the, the objective behind all of this is to create uh, some new revenue for the city. Now just quickly, there are a few things here uh, to which this doesn't apply. It does apply, obviously, there's a different category of fish here altogether for any type of philanthropic contributions or donations. Those are things that people uh, generously give to the city expecting nothing in return, so that's off the table here. Uh, this is obviously only applying to, as well, to uh, civic properties, and part of this you'll see some references to advertising. Uh, those of you who were here last time at Purpose Services will remember a presentation that was made about the possibility of doing advertising inside the parfaits. And so the uh, intent here is that everything appropriate to uh, naming rights would also apply to advertising in parfaits. Uh, and so it's not particularly uh, intent to diverge from that and some of the same principles and values would apply. This has nothing to do with streets, avenues, and roads. Uh, should we ever decide to go down that, uh, that uh, avenue, so to speak, uh, it would be entirely different and we'd have to have that discussion. Uh, this is also only applying to corporates and individuals. Uh, this means, obviously, that the two most large uh, and most common groups of uh, donors are obviously corporations and businesses whether they be local or beyond our uh, local and regional realm. And also there are, of course, very generous individuals who at different times uh, wish to provide their name and resources for particular buildings. Obvious examples uh, in Victoria, of course, are associated with the University of Victoria around you know, Mr. Wright and a variety of other people. So though both individuals and corporations have an opportunity to participate in the structure. Uh, it would apply across the city to all departments, so all departments would eventually be involved in decision making, which we'll talk about later. And obviously, any naming rights that we have right now, uh, particularly for us, we think of the Saint Juan Police Memorial Arena, 
uh, would obviously be exempt from this until the time of their renewal, and then uh, any existing contracts on the uh, at the point of their renewal would have to be uh, brought into this scheme. So there are some global principles uh, which would guide any decisions that were made, and then there will be some other uh, more detailed ideas which we'll go through in a minute. But globally, I think it's really important to say that we need to decide whether or not uh, we want to go down this road at all. So the question is, do we welcome such proposals? Uh, at the same time, even if we do say yes, the very important thing to remember is that we have the absolute right, as a city and as a council in particular, uh, to make a decision that says, you know what, we don't think this is a good idea. We can say no for any reason whatsoever because we just think that it doesn't uh, fit with the city, so we reserve a right to safeguard against excessive commercialization. Uh, the really important thing to say here is that, in fact, yes, we do only uh, allow things that we're comfortable with, and it means that uh, we have the opportunity to say no for any reason whatsoever, and uh, we don't necessarily have to be uh, particularly uh, certain about what those reasons are, but later on you'll see that we do have an obligation to let people know, generally speaking, why we would say no. Um, so we withhold for any reason. Uh, we obviously want to complement the stated mission goals and values of the city. Uh, right now the values are very clear about respect, integrity, inclusivity, and compassion. Uh, we would be very clear about not wanting to entertain any kind of a uh, proposal uh, that would in any way breach any of those values. I think they're absolutely critical to the operation of the city, and so we need to have those as the general guide. Uh, there would be some properties, of course, that would be unavailable. Other examples in other cities are things like libraries, uh, the city hall, uh, particularly uh, historical or um, particularly unique to the city types of buildings. Although um, there's a bullet that's unfortunately not coming up in the bottom, it does say that uh, in exceptional circumstances, uh, there would be an opportunity to have discussions about historical properties, but there would have to be a demonstration of something that was truly exceptional, and it would certainly be outside the norm. So generally speaking, in addition to those larger principles, there'd be a number of general regulations that would be used to consider whether or not any of these things would be appropriate. Uh, the first thing, obviously, is that any type of a proposal will have to come to council, particularly, uh, and uh, of course, there, there's going to be, I'll show you in a few minutes, uh, talk about how some pieces would be for staff to be, uh, of course, uh, having uh, a role to play in making recommendations beforehand, but ultimately, every, every application would have to come to council and would be subject to council to find approval. Uh, three particular things that would be helpful to evaluate the proposal, again going back to the need to make sure that there would have to be uh, significant community considerations and uh, a way to match the vision and uh, principles of the city against any application. Uh, obviously you want to look at who the applicant was and whether their own mission, vision and values were in contradiction to our own. You obviously want to look at what they were selling, what they produced, how they worked, or where they worked. You obviously don't want to engage with any kind of an agent or an agency or a corporation who fundamentally uh, have practices, whether they're business practices or values or whatever, uh, again, contradict uh, with anything that's included uh, in the city, uh, particularly, of course, anything that we do around ethical purchasing policies. We have to make sure that uh, if there is such an agreement that it doesn't in any way diverge uh, from our own priorities. And then, of course, there would be a predisposition uh, towards applicants who can already demonstrate some kind of an existing relationship with the community. Uh, in particular, you think of examples, for example, of uh, how we already uh, have a naming rights policy or naming rights agreement with Island Farms for the uh, for the Victoria Day Parade, and obviously that's a pretty easy one because we all love Island Farms and they already have an existing relationship with the broad range of the community, so that's a perfectly good example of when it works well. Ultimately, the city would retain ownership and control of everything. Uh, we don't want to engage in anything where any agreement uh, impairs our ability to manage the facility. Uh, we'd look at proposals, but we have no obligation ever to accept any of them for any reason. Uh, we obviously have the right to refuse for any reason, and uh, we're not in a position where we need to necessarily go to a competition uh, if, in fact, it's initiated by a third party. All the agreements would be written, of course, and any new money that was generated by this would be allocated by council, of course, after receiving the advice of finance uh, in our regular budgeting process. Uh, of course, we have to conform to all the laws, and uh, importantly, any physical display wouldn't be able to detract from the char character, integrity, and set of quality, safety, or our ability to use the particular, uh, the particular uh, facility. None of this could confer a personal benefit on any of us. Uh, obviously, uh, no terms would be able to conflict with any occupation agreement that we have in any of the facilities, uh, whether it be a rented facility or an owned facility. 
I would obviously have to make sure that there was no implied or real endorsement by the city of anything that was being associated uh, with the agent or its products, services, or ideas. So despite the fact that the Save One Foods Memorial Arena is named after uh, Save One Foods, there's no implication there that the city has a particularly preferential uh, relationship with Save One or is in any way uh, endorsing their particular products. Uh, obviously, we'd have the right to terminate, uh, particularly to avoid any uh, suggestion of uh, disrepute or to avoid any uh, inclination to get into a, a legal dispute. And ultimately, there would need to be an assurance that there was no incremental net cost to the city. That means that if for the term of the contract, uh, there would be no additional cost to the city for any kind of maintenance or upkeep uh, or any other uh, additional cost. So specifically, running through quickly uh, the terms of each particular agreement, just to give you a flavor of what they might look like. Of course, they would always be for a fixed term, uh, and there would be no right of automatic renewal. There would have to be negotiations at all times. Uh, benefits would be limited, obviously, just to what was in the agreement. No indemnification, of course, without express approval of our legal departments. Uh, transferring of the names would never be able to occur without the consent of counsel. Uh, there is an interesting uh, uh, side to this particular one, and that's associated with the reference to all their costs. There have been examples in other cities where a particular uh, naming right has been assigned to a particular company, which has then been bought by another company, and so the name uh, has been suggested to be changed. Uh, that usually is allowed to be done as long as all of the costs associated with that are, are associated with the company itself, and that it doesn't change any other uh, material term uh, of the contract. Again, going back to not having any implication of endorsement uh, by the city or any obligation by the city to uh, prefer a particular brand or a particular product or a particular company, and um, obviously that there'd be no real or perceived competitive advantage for whoever the name might be. So in general, uh, how would this work? Well, Brenda can have a heart attack right here. <laughs> <laughs> it starts out by saying, and so the director of finance. <laughs> Which we all may know, of course, means that the finance department, but of course the director of finance ultimately <laughs> is responsible, uh, would proactively be planned to cancel on a periodic basis. I would suggest the easiest way would be to build this into the uh, annual uh, financial reporting and uh, budgetary processes. And essentially, none of this is rocket science. Uh, you would see a plan that includes uh, inventories of potential properties, uh, evaluations of the value and the desirability and the marketability and potential sponsors for those properties. Uh, important to consider that there would need to be some kind of an assessment of public response or the potential impact on the local community. Uh, how that would actually work, obviously, is a subject for future discussion. And, of course, uh, suggestions, as of course I'm sure uh, the finance department would and the director would have any courses for how we might use those funds. Um, once approved, of course, and again I go back to the fact that ultimately any approval has to rest with council. And again, I remind people that council has the absolute authority to decline for uh, any given reason whatsoever. But obviously agreements would be very typical. They would have uh, details of the terms, uh, the values, the schedules, the rights and benefits, releases, identification, insurance, clauses, confidentiality, all that sort of thing. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, and then when you start looking at what you would consider, of course you would consider uh, each proposal on its merits, uh, obviously with the larger principles that we talked about at the beginning, but also with the rest of these terms. And you would need, of course, to assume that there would be consultation with related departments and affected properties. A perfectly good example, of course, would be the conference center where there would need to be an extensive conversation uh, with their uh, staff and directors about how this might work. Again, going back to uh, nothing happens, of course, until uh, council approves. Uh, and additionally, looking forward, if in fact we do go down this road, there would be an expectation that there would be, of course, an annual report looking back at what each year uh, might have included and how it worked. Uh, the agreements would always be available uh, to the public uh, on our web new fabulous website. Uh, and I think that it would be important also to make sure that whatever process we end up with, we do go down this road, is also clearly explain, explained on the website so that any potential applicants would have a clear sense of how this would work. Um, as far as looking at the proposals themselves and how it might work, I mean, this is not particularly difficult to, as well. I mean, I mean, anybody could suggest a potential opportunity. Uh, finance, of course, would be responsible for preparing and releasing the request for proposals for any particular facility. Of course, after receiving approval from the city manager and council, uh, it could be uh, these particular uh, RFPs or ideas could be part of a larger plan, as we talked about, or they could be unique. I think that very often you find circumstances where particular um, particular construction or renovation or particular approaches come that are not necessarily part of a proactive plan, but are. Uh, unexpected uh, potential, and those would have to be accommodated as well. 
uh, everything would be in writing, of course, and that there would be an ability for finance to bring whatever extra criteria and assessment uh, to the decision that would seem appropriate for the particular facility, the circumstance, etc. cetera. Uh, there is an opportunity here, and I think this is something that requires specific conversation about whether or not this is best done in-house or through a broker. Uh, cities across the country and in North America particularly do both. Uh, I think there's a, a better comfort with the idea that this would be managed in-house because there's a better uh, fit with the notion of being able to more adequately apply the uh, vision and values of the city to any particular application. Uh, however, of course, this is a larger discussion around resources and capacity, so it's important to think that that might be an option. But again, only, of course, uh, with the approval of the city manager and council. Again, I want to reiterate that the underlying tenant of this is that city council has the final authority and can reject for any reason at all uh, any particular application. That is the fastest I've ever tried to explain this to anyone. <laughs> uh, the document you have is much more detailed, and I have a much longer version of it if you're really interested in that. But essentially, the reason that I wanted to bring this forward today is that it seemed like a uh, oh, thank you. It seemed like a um, a good place to start the conversation, and so the recommendations here are simply to suggest that the Perfect Services Committee uh, recommend that this go forward uh, to governance and priorities on April 5th. That's going to be an interesting meeting, really long, uh, for further discussion, and that uh, should it uh, feel appropriate, and I think I would ask that the staff uh, provide comments uh, on the document here uh, for GPC uh, to further inform uh, the discussion of and that's it. Uh, let me just say that I understand clearly that there is an extraordinary amount of controversy associated with this path. Uh, I'm not unaware of the fact that there are uh, many uh, points of view on the appropriateness of introducing naming rights uh, into the city budget and into the city planning process and into the community at large. Having said that, I don't believe that there's anyone uh, today who watches us struggle with our requirement to increasingly provide community services uh, to our residents that have often been the responsibility of other levels of government and are being offloaded to us while at the same time we are not being allowed to increase in an appropriate way our taxation burden. I don't believe anyone is opposed to adding to our services that we have the ability to uh, add new uh, and different ways to provide income. And I think this is one of the ways. So again, I start, uh, I finish with where I started, and that is to say, I know it's a hard conversation, but I think it's time for us to have it. Thank you. Thank you, Pam Peralta. Your Worship, I take it you are moving the recommendation? Uh, yes, please. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, further to that, and, and I will say, that having over the past three years and continuing again this year, going out and talking to all our citizens about what budgets look like, what the basic options that we have, which is to increase taxes, cut services, or increase revenue, that when asked where they want to go, generally they all go to the increase the revenue stuff. That They don't necessarily want to see increased taxes. <clears throat> they appreciate and want more services and so I have to take a look at uh, ways to increase uh, revenue. So uh, I wanted to acknowledge that that is something that uh, I agree with you, something is not an easy one, but one we need to look at and um, certainly can carry that conversation as we move forward with budget, con budget uh, community budget consultations. Specifically under um, page three, general regulations, um, <coughs> three quarters of the way down, it says in evaluating naming rights proposals the city will consider and then item three says a predisposition towards applicants who can demonstrate an existing relationship with the community. Right. Uh, I'm aware that um, generally for the larger ones, it's either someone who is leaving a community and wants to say thank you, or uh, someone who wants to enter a community and then get their name known. So perhaps I just try to tweak that a little to say uh, it can demonstrate an existing relationship within or just right, how can I put it? Somehow, in the sense that it represents that they have a they have a proven ability uh, to have relationships with communities. Some other community doesn't necessarily right. have to be our community versus uh, what is their track record in other cities and other communities and those sort of things. Just to recognize where um, we're from that way. Good point. That's that's that was only the small tweaking on that, but 
personally, I'd like to say thank you for the work you've done on this. It's um, an amazing I, amount of work. Hold well on. Yeah, it's, um, it is a contentious area. Um, I appreciate very much that you've developed the policy discussion without putting dollar values to it, because I think that sometimes uh, clouds people's rationality as we move forward with the policy issue. So I think the framework is very useful, and we'll, I'm sure it'll be a fascinating discussion around the council table. Um, but I very much appreciate having this brought forward. And I'm, I'm, my only concern is that April 5th is designated in it. I'm not sure, because it looks as though we may have a heavy agenda. I'm not sure that we don't want to, sometime in April, have a workshop on this, um, or have it at a different uh, GPC meeting. But I, other than that, Thank you so much for bringing this forward. I'm quite supportive of it, of the discussion. You can I just call the question and move yep, forward? Yeah, all in favor, moving it forward to GPC. Done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Budget discussions. Um, <clears throat> and I'm sorry that I wasn't here for the last budget discussions uh, because I was in Kitchener. But I'm, I'm aware that we've moved forward with um, yeah, thank you. Um, some stuff. Brenda, I do know that there was an issue, and we just had it highlighted for us earlier today, that one of the long-term focuses has to be going to bring the tax lift down. Um, so we have sent a direction to staff around 3.5% is my understanding. Um, I, I suppose personally, um, and perhaps this table would like to take a look and see if there's some play to bring some other components in to bring it down some more. Um, and, and I realize that there's pain involved in that <laughs> process. I know that there were earlier discussions, Councillor Alto, I know you had some thoughts around this, and, and I would like to keep it rather than Council going through the line by line assessment and saying, I want you to cut X, I would like to keep it at the higher policy level mm -hmm. um, and have us give some direction. I know, Councillor Alto, you had some thoughts on that as well. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I mean, I, I've had some conversations with some of my colleagues as well as the Director of Finance. And uh, it's really interesting really listening to um, uh, Peter's presentation earlier today because of what the, the piece that comes through for me overall was his ultimate recommendation, regardless of the mechanics of it, the notion that we have to continue to look at ways to reduce the overall tax increase. And so uh, I originally did what I'm not supposed to do as a city councillor, and I went through all of the budgets line by line and started hacking things out. <laughs> and then I went, okay, that's not my job. <laughs> so after um, having some very informative conversations with a variety of folks, um, I put that piece aside and thought I would just raise at the committee level today a couple of ideas, a couple of specific ideas and then a general, uh, a general thought. Uh, first of all, I do think it's important for us to tell the public the direction in which we're going. And the last year, of course, we set uh, a budget, uh, maximum budget increase of 3.5%, which of course was less than the year before, so that's great. And uh, I think personally that I would like to suggest overall that we move even further uh, in that direction. So I'm going to suggest three, uh, four things actually. First I'm going to suggest uh, a very minor thing which uh, is of course a line item budget but I think, a line item in the budget, but I do think that it's important uh, to use this I guess as an example of uh, how council is in fact looking really under every rock for every penny. And so I'm going to suggest, first of all, that we do a very minor thing, and that is that we eliminate all of our internal catering. Uh, because we work long outer hours, and we're often working through lunches, and occasionally even uh, through suppers, uh, we do have the capacity, and we do now provide uh, food for uh, councillors uh, and staff uh, associated with council meetings and uh, Committee of the Whole, the GPC meetings, and our standing committees like this one. And although it's not an enormous budget item, it is uh, in the range, as I understand, of around eleven or twelve thousand dollars a year. And so, you know, small thing, but an important gesture. And I hasten to say that that would not include uh, the public advisory bodies. Uh, I think it's important for us to uh, suggest that the folks who give of their time voluntarily to come and provide us with advice and input uh, often do so over the lunch hour. And I think it's appropriate for us to offer them some kind. Uh, of small reward, <laughs> and so uh, this is not looking at the entire catering budget, but simply at the uh, the budget that uh, looks to cater uh, council 
uh, and committee meetings, uh, particularly uh, standing committees and committee of the whole. So that would be one thing. Uh, the second thing is that uh, I do know that around uh, the province there are folks who are looking at different issues around uh, Council's pay and benefits. I am aware that it is extremely uh, difficult and I think inappropriate for Council to start meddling in its own Council, in its own um, pay and benefits discussions. So I'm not going to suggest that we do anything specific around that, but what I would like to suggest is that we look at a policy basis to regularizing the Citizens Committee that we had I believe it was in 2008, uh, look at the council uh, benefits and pay scale and, and um, try and uh, bring some continuity to that process uh, so that a fair and uh, dispassionate uh, review and consideration of all of the issues involved with that uh, can be done fairly. I think the mayor is about to be <coughs> Sorry. Mm okay. And so what I'd like to suggest is my second recommendation is that we regularize the Citizens Committee process and ask them to, on a, a routine basis, re review the council <coughs> salaries and benefits package and match that to the five-year budgeting cycle. So that every five years uh, a committee would be struck, that they would look at the council's uh, benefit package and the, and the council's pay rate, uh, do the same type of work that they did in 2008, the comparative work, the analysis, and come up with a recommendation <coughs> that would be future-looking. So I think, it, again, it's, it's messaging the reality that we understand that everyone is having to tighten their belts and we're willing to do that too, but that we're not going to uh, try and do it in a way which is ad hoc or uninformed, uh, but that we're going to look to the process that we've used before, which worked very well, uh, and to ask our citizens to provide us with this advice on a routine and regular basis that somewhat matches our budget cycle. So that would be my second recommendation. Uh, my third recommendation is that we uh, institute, uh, again, which has been done before, I understand, uh, but I think, again, it would be useful to regularize this, uh, a process which begins to look, again, perhaps in a five-year cycle, uh, what our service uh, delivery capacity is. When we uh, look to what cities do, and in particular our own, I think it's important for us to, on a regular basis, again, on a routine basis that's outside of the political realm, uh, to look at our, um, our management capacity, our staffing capacity, our financial capacity, uh, the desires and uh, expectations of our residents, and try and put all of those things together in a way which makes sense to look at what really is appropriate for us as a city uh, to be delivering in the sense of services. Uh, we all want to deliver everything. We want to be able to be in a position where we can give people everything that they would need uh, in order to have a fantastic quality of life. Uh, we do as much as we can and we will continue to do that, but I think uh, looking at the challenges that we're facing from a budgetary capacity, uh, that it would be useful for us to again regularize this analysis to, on a five-year basis, begin to say, all right, here's what we, are, we have as an expectation of our capacity from an income perspective. Uh, here's what we've heard from our residents. They're expecting us to deliver from a service capacity. How, would we, how do we put those two things together? I do know that we have had uh, a service delivery review just a couple of years ago, uh, but I think it's timely to consider doing it again and doing it in the context of again making it a regular process that's part of our routine uh, operational expectation and so that we get again match that to our budgetary process. So it's an every five year thing. Uh, and I expect that it would be personally in my sense that it would be useful for us to do that sooner rather than later. Again, while we're looking at uh, some new uh, opportunities around potential new funding, uh, as well as uh, having our uh, difficult discussions around priorities and uh, capacity in the coming months. Uh, so that would be my third recommendation. And my last recommendation is uh, something that in fact is more specific, and that is that I believe that it would be appropriate for us to, uh, co cognizant of the fact that our, our staff have done an extraordinary job in moving our budget from 4% to 3.5% uh, lift this year. Uh, that I would like to suggest that we uh, turn back to them again and ask them if they could take another look and take that lift from three and a half down to three. Uh, I would make some suggestions while not wanting to interfere in their uh, ability to make the best possible recommendations and being cognizant that they've already cut 1.2 million dollars uh, out of the budget and I'm not suggesting that that should change. Uh, I do think that there is an opportunity, uh, having done that um, micromanaging uh, line by line analysis, that there are some opportunities for us to look at making some uh, reductions uh, in a couple of areas, uh, and I'm just going to speak to them in general terms. Uh, one in particular, I think that there, there, uh, there is, was 
I think there was no concern on my part, I'll speak, there was no concern in particular uh, on the presentations uh, by the police for their budget, budget for uh, 2012. Uh, however, in the same context as looking at the uh, capacity of uh, the city and all of its departments, uh, to really look hard at what we're spending and to really understand that it's important for all of us to try and go down as opposed to up. I do think that there are some areas in the police budget which are not, uh, not at all related to their uh, ability to uh, do their jobs well, which they do, uh, but to look at the savings of perhaps a couple of hundred thousand dollars and making some decisions around whether or not they need to purchase all of their motorbikes this year, uh, whether or not they have the capacity to make some reductions in their miscellaneous uh, expenditures, uh, and to, in fact, uh, not increase their professional or fees or office supplies. I offer those as suggestions only. I do think there's some potential as well uh, in the capital budget to perhaps uh, slow the pedestrian master plan a little from the perspective of whether or not we actually do have the capacity uh, to spend a half a million dollars this year. I do understand that some of our other uh, budgetary reductions in parks uh, were tied to the fact that we don't actually have the capacity to do the work anyway, and I wondered out loud whether that was the same uh, circumstance for the master plan, which is currently set at uh, 510000 for this year. I think perhaps there's an opportunity to save a little bit of money there. We've had discussions already about the Beacon Hill transportation plan, so I, and I, I don't need to belabor that. Uh, and in addition to that, looking at the operational budget, um, you know, I've spoken again uh, uh, already about uh, the minor changes to our catering. And I would look, in fact, and specifically and suggest uh, in one particular area uh, to perhaps look at uh, the balance uh, of the cuts required to achieve a 3% lift uh, would be to look specifically at the contracted services budget. I do know that there are areas in there, of course, which uh, have no ability to change, and those are very hard things like our uh, contracts for software, etc. And uh, there are, of course, agreements that are in place which couldn't be terminated uh, because we have um, uh, contracts and agreements with individuals and corporations which we, of course, would not breach. But there are other areas which I would suggest uh, do have some room to maneuver. And so um, I guess for that last piece for my fourth recommendation, uh, looking at uh, reducing again uh, by another half a percent from three and a half to three percent, uh, I think we could uh, find those uh, five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars or so. Uh, generally from those three areas, I know that it's a hard thing to ask and I know how much work you've done already and I can't say how much I appreciate it. But I do think this is achievable and I understand um, that it's not a simple piece of work. But that's, that's what I'd like to suggest. And so those were four uh, suggestions or recommendations for the committee to consider. A wan smile comes over Brenda's face. And I'm sorry. <laughs> and I apologize in advance. <clears throat> um, and, I think and I can only be happy that this isn't a surprise. <laughs> and, I, and I think it's a useful discussion and direction. With respect to number four, I think the direction to staff is to look again and see if they could perhaps, and it has to actually go through council yes. to then to staff, um, for three and a half to three be the tax lift. I, I think you note the possible areas, but that's not part no, of no, the no. motion specifically. It's yes. up to staff, and you might want to look specifically at these areas, but you know, see if you can come back and find some stuff, and I think that would be useful. And if I could just add to that before sure. we go to the mayor, I, and one thing I just wanted to make clear, and I didn't, sorry, was that I think it's really important to say that although I'm proposing this to the, to the Corporate Services Committee today, uh, and it will choose what it wishes to do with these suggestions as far as the report to Council on Thursday, I think it's very important that uh, that staff do nothing on this until Council has an opportunity to discuss it on Thursday. I don't want to make uh, extra work uh, for uh, staff uh, unless Council thinks that this is an appropriate direction to pursue. So I think it's important to remember that the next step in this would be for this discussion uh, to be reported in the minutes and for this committee to decide whatever it decides and for whatever that is to go to council before staff does anything. Thank you. I, th that's, the most uh, that's the most important direction that I understand the staff takes the direction from council as a whole as that's opposed right. to yeah. anyone individual or even uh, from a committee. Specifically um, regarding the council pay benefits, if I could tweak that a little bit. Um, uh, that the interest would be to do it. I think you'd need to do it every. Th if we do it, do it every three years. Ooh. But always do it in. I can put it that the outgoing council will receive recommendations mm -hmm. that it can put into place for the incoming council. I wouldn't. And, and so, in that sense, there's always that separation between 
uh, the current council voting on changes to its benefits versus right. the future council, which may be the exact same council, but that's up to the electorate as opposed to. So the five-year cycle would get us out of that. So right. that, that would be the difficulty. But, right. but I think that's an always fair one, and then council can take a look at that. Um, it obviously will also make that every election will be an issue. People may choose to make an issue of council pay on that. But uh, I certainly have seen a lot of discussion coming forward on that where people have deliberately said zero, zero, and zero, and now West Kelowna's got a 12% increase, to, to, which sounds a lot until you realize they didn't take any, and, and but we've often said that um, uh, being on council cannot be uh, just reserved for the retired or the wealthy, mm -hmm. that, that everyone needs to be able to, to do this in an equitable way. Uh, and then everything else, I'll wait for, for council uh, for this to go forward. Um, it is one of those difficult ones where you go, like to take a, one last kick at it. How do we get it down to three uh, without digging in specifically on you know things that you like? To, but don't touch that one versus oh I don't value that one. Uh, it has to be in context of, of um, you coming forward. Um, and if this does move forward, that it's not about looking at capital programs. Although it it is worthwhile to note that when we make cuts to capital programs, I think a lot of people. I'll give an example: is the bus shelter. Uh, one of the things we're looking at is, is taking $15,000 out of the bus shelter. And, and that isn't, <clears throat> and everyone thinks, oh, it's just a cut to capital, it's not a cut to operating. Uh, the truth is on that $15,000 uh, of to um, bus shelters, there's probably $3,000 material. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other 13000 is actually allocated to a job project uh, in our department, which means it actually does have an effect on staffing and, and, and operating levels and those sort of things. So. Uh, I didn't want to slip by that there's sort of perception of, uh, you know, it's not a case of buying a car or not buying a car, it's about building a car <laughs> with our own people. So, um, be interested, see what comes back. Can I make one more comment? Of course you can. I just, I just, I, I just want to follow up one thing that the mayor said, and that is that, uh, I mean, obviously, you know, there's a significant proposal for capital reductions in the existing uh, budgetary proposals, and I really appreciate that. So for me, I, I think that uh, the, the nominal um, reductions in the proposed police budget and the, I, I think, uh, arguably nominal suggestions here in the capital budgets are for that reason. I think the, it is the operational budget to which we have to look uh, for further uh, further reductions. And I, I think that that's why I looked specifically uh, at the contracted services as an area because it does two things. Uh, one, it is an area where we do have some control, although obviously a limited amount. Uh, but it reflects, I think, an important message that we have extraordinary confidence in our staff. Uh, you know, we have very, very talented people. I understand that there are some things that we can't do because they're very, very specialized and those are contracts that can't be touched. Uh, but I believe that there are other areas where uh, our staff uh, can be looked uh, to for that kind of skill uh, and, uh, and operation. So, None of these things are easy. You start with that right off the bat. Even moving from where we were last year to 3.5% was an extraordinary achievement. Uh, I just think that it's important for us to look even further, even harder. And the context of our discussion earlier with Peter and his numbers and the context of the discussion of the potential of naming rights, this all comes together in a package. And uh, unfortunately, uh, this is our reality and it's one that we have to grapple with. So thank you for your consideration. Thank you. So a 0.5% is about 400,000? Yeah, just over 500. Yeah, over five. almost six, I thought. But, yeah. We'll talk more on Thursday. Yes, we will. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, we will. I'll take a point. Can I? So, so we don't I, meet on Thursday. May I make those? Uh, uh, Thursday evening there's a council Thursday meeting and it will receive the report of this committee. And that was the uh, intention. Okay, thank you. So I was going to, sh should I make those four recommendations yes, as part of the committee report and the council can just uh, decide what they yeah. want to do with them. You write right. a copy of those? Oh, I can give them to you. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Sorry. Any further comments? And thank you again for, for doing this. I know it's been... Brenda. Uh, would you like me to comment? Please. Or, please. Yes. The appropriate time? Um, <laughs> certainly um, in terms of... I just have a, a quick comment in terms of uh, um, the... Um, motion to eliminate uh, internal catering. I just wanted to hesitate, you know, have some hesitation mm 
on that because um, there's how many times uh, are you meeting when you don't intend it and it goes longer and I think uh, I, I personally uh, staff have sat through meetings where um, we're not planning to be there all day and, and it's tough when you're sitting there and there's no opportunity to um, uh, to be fed so I think you have to be have that you know that's just my uh, comments right is that um, often uh, the meetings go right and, and uh, it's hard to break or you'll have to break and go out and get something again it causes delays in terms of your meeting schedule and also um, it's very hard when you lose energy and you don't and it, so I just wanted to, to that's just my comments based on uh, some of the the times I've sat there and, and see you go through uh, for long meetings where um, sometimes being fed is uh, um, needs you to get, get, get done earlier as well. So time uh, is a concern there. Um, in terms of uh, the budget um, at 3%, um, uh, I just wanted to outline that uh, the 1.2 million uh, is the cut that we put forward at the end, but keep in mind there, that was on top of millions of cuts that we've already had yes. done. Uh, this year, last year, and the year before. So um, that will not be easy. So um, certainly uh, we can go back if the council desires uh, and, and look at it again. But um, I think in terms of the uh, um, what staff put forward in terms of how to get to 3.5 at the end, the additional 1.2 uh, was a reduction to the increase mm -hmm. to capital. And I'm, I'll go over that more at the next budget meeting, but I think the, um, I may perhaps to <coughs> highlight enough that what we're, what we're cutting, or uh, recommending to cut, that 920,000 in particular, um, those were cuts to capital that have never been funded. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're um, that's one thing we're going to do during uh, 2012 is, is look at our capital program um, and look at how much uh, uh, was funded. As I mentioned, uh, the last budget meeting is that we, we've we built the 20-year capital plan assuming a 1.5% increase in the capital levy each year, as well as a transfer to our capital reserves. Um, when I look back over the past uh, 13 years, uh, we've met that 1.5% levy three times. Mm -hmm. And that the last time I believe was in 2006. Um, it may not be a, the right number, um, and I just wanted to highlight that those it's the increase. And when I look at so I'll bring some statistics to the next budget meeting to show, um, in my opinion, that recommendation that we put forward to balance the budget at 3.5 percent by cutting the increase to the capital is the right uh, decision. Um, it's um, I, my preference is to uh, to have uh, a workshop with council uh, going forward to look at what our uh, capacity is, uh, look at what council's uh, priority uh, initiatives are, and um, and also uh, looking at our capital. I, I believe that we need to we need to do more work on our capital. I'm going to propose that we actually uh, go to a zero-based budget for our, for our capital. I think it's time. Um, I've done a bit of, uh, had staff do a, um, a, a bit of work for me at this point just to prepare for this meeting uh, that shows the amount of, of um, additional funding we've put into capital over the last decade. And it's not inconsiderable. Like we have put a lot of money in, so it's time uh, that we step back and look at our funding for our capital. And I just want to put that on, is because I know, and I'm the first one to to, uh, to comment about the importance of our assets and maintaining them, and our infrastructure, and how essential that is for economic development, for for quality of life. Um, but we we have to uh, look at what that funding is. We also need to look at our operating budget. I feel that very strongly in terms of uh, our affordability. But it, sh it needs to be in context, and, and there's more work that we need to do in finance. So I just want to put that on the table: is that um, it's uh, it's complex, um, but we've done a lot. I've highlighted that last budget meeting. Staff have done a lot of work in our capital plan last year. There's another step Actually. that needs to be done. Um, I want them to start now uh, and tear it apart and look at. Uh, let's start. Um, 
with uh, um, what we what we have, what we need to maintain, what are our priority um, uh, assets that we need to maintain, what are new things that we're adding each year, and also what are the things that are currently unfunded. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to put that in context. I'd like to start uh, um, as a zero-based budgeting, and that will inform us mm -hmm. and inform council in terms of how much should we be levying each year, and should that be 1.5%, should it be 1%, should it be 0.75%, what should it be? My gut feel is that it needs to be at least 0.5% because that's probably covering off the cost of uh, uh, increase in cost of inflation, right? So, um, but I just want to has I just want to put that on the table uh, for you to consider that um, we need to, to work on this uh, together and I need to, to, I want to bring forward um, the concept that we need to also look at our capital funding to make sure it's adequate and that the, the right decisions are made between what our increase, um, uh, the city's increase should be for capital and also what uh, it should be for uh, operating uh, based on our current services and also what business we want that the council wants us to be in. So I think that 3% is going to be very difficult for us to do that. I think if we do that, we may, and certainly um, we, uh, we can look at these things that council wishes us to bring it down to 3%, but I also want to caution you that um, it may be that uh, it is the increase in the transfer to capital that is still the right way to go. Thank you for the caution and, and it's always good advice. I think the reality is for us we need to keep going through the assessment of where we need to focus and, and we know from the, the charts we had earlier that the cumulative impact of increases in the past are not sustainable. So we need to focus and that's we are guided by staff because we aren't supposed to get into the line-by-line -line micromanaging, but we have to give some direction and say, can can this work? It may be that council doesn't wish to go there, and that's that's fine. That's but that's a discussion that this committee thinks that we should at least try and engage it, and I think that's fair. Can I call a question mark, or do you have a question? Mark? The difficulty I, I have, sorry, so first of all, I totally agree. I want to go from 3.5 down to 3. That's an easy, yeah. that's an easy statement to say. The difficulty I have is okay, that important. larger discussion, and, and, only, and under operating budgets, it's like I'm trying to figure out, like, what do you do less of? Mm -hmm. And that's the difficulty. Do you do less line painting? Do you do less sidewalk repair? Do you do less potholes? Do you do less? Variety of things like that, um, and the easy answer is is is, or, or so the hard answer is, um, no. Uh, in the sense that the citizens are saying, wait a minute, you know, uh, I want benches on my bus stops. I want new paint. At least give me some fresh coat of paint on my uh, that on the yellow lines because those are the ones that are important to make my neighborhood look good. Um, you know, do you cut the grass every once a month as opposed to every two weeks, or um, and then and the consequences of that, and then that's doing it in context or out of context of that larger discussion of what is the operation that we shouldn't be doing anymore, uh, because that's that bigger chunk. So, uh, you know, that's why, you know, is it easier to try and find an extra? What did you say? Six hundred thousand for a five point five percent. Versus an extra 2.5 percent, which is well, maybe the council says as a group we think 3.5 is fine. Recognizing yes, that when it was be. first projected um, last year, it was to be 4.7, and staff worked really, really hard to bring it down to 3.5. But we need to keep that discussion in play. So yeah, there are no easy answers to that one, Brenda. I think just one other comment as well is that uh, keep in mind that. Um, the 3.5% or whatever it happens to be, uh, we, have, we have not, staff have not put forward how we're going to fund a, um, a website analyst, mm -hmm. are we going to invest in, yeah. in more records management. There's a yeah. lot of things that we haven't brought forward because of the, um, uh, the difficult uh, economic times. So there's a lot of things that we, uh, um, uh, staff believe we should be investing in that um, 
we haven't brought forward. So it's a challenging time uh, all around. So I think that my um, thoughts are that I would I, I would look forward to a um, priority setting and capacity setting uh, capacity um, discussion with council in a workshop format to look at. What, uh, what business should we be in, but also what are the priorities for council, and an idea of, of the, um, uh, the capacity challenges that uh, the organization is having, and have that as a, as a workshop uh, discussion. And that's why you always hear me say, let's look forward to the five-year plan, and let's get through 2012 um, as best we can, but let's very soon, um, and I believe uh, the city manager will be scheduling those with you, but we need to get into the priority setting and our capacity discussions and, and what business should we be in discussions. And that will help inform um, 2013 forward and then get into things like, uh, as well, um, other revenue sources, but also where we believe there's opportunities to uh, look at things like our parking where we've got a major shortfall. Uh, we can look at things like uh, Crystal Gardens where what, what are options. Uh, for those and put those things forward for council to take. Thank you. Of course, we look forward to all those discussions. Because <laughs> they're so much fun. Can I call the question on the motion? Is there all in favor? That's moving it to uh, for council yes. to take a look at. Yes, that's all. Right. Let's all move for council to take a look at. Thank you. I'm opposed. Um, Worship, I did add one and, and one and a half items under five, and it's just notice for the next meeting. I, I personally would like to have um, our HR people here because that comes in the mandate of corporate services to have a discussion about uh, benefits and LTD for the full range of staff so just so we can better understand what's available for um, union members and exempt members just so we can put that in context because I, I think one of our preferred policies is to be one of the best employers in the country, um, not just in the municipal sector, but one of the best employers. And I think that there may be some areas where we need to focus some attention. So that's one, and just given the discussions as a second issue, um, we've had discussions about our grants policy, and I did pull um, the 12 attributes of good investment for the voluntary nonprofit sector from the Canadian Comprehensive Auditing Foundation and the uh, 20 criteria of control from the Canadian Institute of Chartered Accountants. And I think this could frame part of the discussion for the future. So I got a, a copy, I gave a copy to Council Aldo and to, okay. to Brenda uh, in the past. But I think it might be a useful template for us to work on as we move forward with the different components of what I hope would be a portfolio of municipal investments as opposed to just out of our parents. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can I call for a motion to adjourn, please? So moved. Thank you. All in favor? Yes. Thank you all.